Hello and welcome to the Young Texas Summer Reform Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor DeSoto. In today's episode, I'm going to be reading a somewhat fiery article. Uh, just as a disclaimer, there are a lot of generalizations in the article because I believe that generalizations are important uh, in terms of speaking truth to issues. You, you can't be overly nuanced uh, all the time. So let's get into it. The article is called The Textual Atheism That Plagues the Church. So in today's church world, in the Christi- the circles of Christianity, there are a lot of orthodox, perfectly orthodox statements that are very controversial. Many of these controversial statements have to do with believing in the miracles detailed in scripture. If I were to say, for example, that God created the world out of nothing in six days, or that Moses parted the Red Sea, there would be scholars and perhaps even liberal Christians who would contest whether those things were actually actually happened. They would be described as metaphor or mythos or something other. This is This is very common. Now, if you were to do that, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you would probably get a lot more pushback from people in the pew. But now we see that the the Overton window of theology is sort of shifting, if you will. Now, it's less controversial to say that Jesus physically rose from the grave, though there are people who call themselves Christian who say that he didn't physically rise from the grave. And just as a, a, a you know, point of clarity for my audience, if you do not believe that Jesus rose from the grave, you are not a Christian. So, one statement in particular, which I find strange, that many people have a lot of discomfort in saying, which is, in my opinion, along the same tier of miracle as uh, as creation, as uh, anything else magnificent that God does, is that... God perfectly and providentially preserved and delivered and made available his holy word. If you're a longtime reader of my blog or a watcher of my podcast, you know that the truism of the statement, in other words, the, the, the just face value of the statement, God perfectly and providentially preserved and delivered and made available his word, uh, might be agreeable to all, even those who perhaps don't agree with it in the same way that the truism seems to indicate. And that is kind of part of the problem right now. The meaning of the truism that I just gave to you uh, can be quite unclear depending on who is actually delivering such a statement. For example, if Dan Wallace were to say the Bible is perfectly preserved and available, he would mean, I don't think he would ever would say that, but I've seen people kind of in his camp say similar things, and they don't mean the same thing that uh, that the Christian standard for orthodoxy would actually indicate. So the way that modern theology is nuanced, overly nuanced, demands a certain level of discernment from you and I. Every syllable in a theological statement has purpose, and changing even one or two words can alter a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. So, for example, if I were to say that Jesus is God, is different than if I were to say Jesus is a part of the Trinity. There are two different things going on there. If I were to say that Jesus is God or Jesus is a part of God, those two words, a part of, part of, those two words change the meaning of how we're defining who God is entirely. Simply adding those two words makes you depart from Christian orthodoxy. It's heretical. So if two words can alter the very core of Christianity, then we must recognize that two words can change a doctrine. Now consider what can be affected when an entire passage is altered or reimagined. An entire story or parable is, is reconfigured to fit another doctrine. If two words can do it, then certainly a whole story can. So as long as I've been a Christian, I've heard professors of the faith, not as in, you know, teachers, but professors, people who claim to be Christian. I've heard these people interpret biblical miracles in such a manner that they 
<clears throat> really aren't miracles any longer by any stretch of the imagination or definition of the word. I've seen every single magnificent work of God explained by way of mythology or metaphor or perhaps some sort of sociological breakdown or analysis. People inject secular paradigms into the pages of the Bible according typically to trends of popular opinion or perhaps a niche interpretation of their favorite scholar. Doctrines that were called heresy comfortably by the church 10 years ago have gained enough traction in today's Christian world to be a widely held belief in the church. I can list examples of nearly every single doctrine that have been affected by this. Doctrine of man, doctrine of God, doctrine of, of, of salvation. I mean, all of the core doctrines of Christianity have been infected with these sort of interpretations or change of meaning. <clears throat> so one example is a is the widespread belief that the atom of scripture was a metaphorical atom or a symbolic atom. According to those who believe typically in theistic evolution, Adam represents a people group, not a person. So while some naively believe that this does not change the Christian religion, they say it's a tertiary issue. In every case, when you despiritualize scripture where it is being spiritual, where there are, where there are miracles contained, some doctrine, some core doctrine has to be affected. And the Christian religion is changed. It is no longer the Christian religion. See, if there was no literal Adam in our example here, then the entire sequence of the fall is purely myth, including the promise of salvation in Genesis 3.15. In short, without a literal Adam, there is no promise or need of a literal Christ. The federal theology of Christian orthodoxy is laid utterly to waste. The entire structure of redemptive history going forward from that point is completely dismantled. It's altered into some mythical sociological explanation of how ancient people viewed the world. In other words, it sorts of, sort of moves to the historical critical uh, sort of paradigm. And, and despite this fact, I have seen countless men who many might be might consider a giant of the faith, so-called, call these reinterpretations just tertiary issues. It's just open hand. Theistic evolution is just open hand. It doesn't matter if there's a need for a literal Christ, that's open hand. According to these men, you can believe in sociological or mythological adaptations of scripture and still somehow have a, a, a coherent understanding of what the gospel is and the need for Jesus Christ. The reality is, especially in the example that I gave, you cannot. So we see that whether it be two words or perhaps reimagining a story in scripture can alter the core doctrines of the Christian faith. A simple examination of these interpretations and the widespread acceptance of such demonstrates that many modern Christians are willing to compromise the fundamentals of the Christian religion and call just about anything an open hand issue. The evidence of this problem can be found by simply reviewing the textbooks in the curriculum of most seminaries, or perhaps the doctrinal statements found on any given church's website, or simply look at the Pew data, which shows, or, or the, the big, <clears throat> forget exactly what poll it was, but the, but the shocking poll that showed that, that a vast majority of evangel people calling themselves evangelicals had no idea how to articulate the Trinity. They ended up being modalist or some... <laughs> other sort of Trinitarian heretic, um, anti-Trinitarian heretic. So this is a problem. The data shows it, the textbooks show it, and what we see anecdotally definitely shows it. So this is, in my opinion, overwhelming evidence that we do have an issue here. And the average layperson does not know the grave theological error of saying something such as Jesus is a part of God. Now let's go into some anecdotal uh, evidence from, from myself here. Anecdotally, my, my first experience with Christianity was sort of the Young Life Campus Crusade for Christ mainstream evangelical version of the religion. In these circles, there was very little that was considered that wasn't considered an open hand issue. Everything was open hand for the most part. Theistic evolution is okay, social trinitarianism, subordinationism, 
female pastors are being applauded. I mean, the list goes on. Any anything that alters the message of 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 and the teaching of the scripture was pretty much okay. And I found that the things which were considered close hand issues were stuff like getting caught smoking cigarettes out back of the Young Life house or being too certain about any one theological issue. In any in other words, things that were socially frowned upon were far more condemning than that which scripture actually condemns. The modern version of Christianity is more of a social club than some sort of biblical religion. It is more controversial in these sort of mainstream evangelical communities, speaking broadly of course, to violate a social norm than it is to have serious theological errors. The great success of the book and movie adaptation of the heretical work called The Shack is a perfect example of this. The Bible is sort of treated as a crystal ball which you can imagine anything in, rather than some sort of, you know, to these people, oh, it could never be some sort of authority for my life. No, no, no. I have to see myself in every page. I get to interpret myself into every every passage. I get to see whatever I would like in the words of Scripture. It is a crystal ball to these sort of mainstream evangelical types, many of them. Now, of course, a quick, I, I just want to clarify here, not every single mainstream evangelical is like this, though we can see from the data, we can see from the books on the shelf in Barnes & Noble, we can see the seminary textbooks. This is a pervasive problem, and it is it is affecting a large number of people who call themselves Christians, and that's the simple reality of it. Anyway, let's get back to the article. The people I met in sort of my days as a mainstream evangelical in those circles were more likely to get their theology from the Christian fiction section than the scriptures. They had self-help books, they had all sorts of things, but not the, not the scriptures. In fact, when I was at Campus Crusade for Christ at ASU, I was told to stop bringing my Bible to my small group. Just, and that was well before anyone thought there was issues with Campus Crusade for Christ, I think. I didn't hear any anybody raising the alarm back then. So, the ever-shrinking Christianity section at Barnes & Noble, which was kind of turned into a spiritual self-help section, then a place to find rich theological literature, is a market response to a real phenomenon that can be quantified easily by a supply chain management, uh, a supply, a supply chain uh, department. Right, the supply chain departments know exactly what's going on with Christianity. Go to Barnes and Noble and take a look. That's what they think of Christianity. That's what they that's what the people are buying, and it demonstrates that there is a quantifiable reality to this this problem. Now, if it were the case that the Christian church, the evangelical church, and even the reformed church was healthy, the shack would not have the shack would not have had success. It would have been an utter failure, and it should have been. But instead, it's a, turned into a feature film. I, I've been gifted, personally, The Shack, like three different times. That's just the reality of it. People say, oh, he's a Christian. He must want to read The Shack. <laughs> Something that clearly is Trinitarian her anti-Trinitarian heresy. So... This is, this is quantifiable from my perspective. Now, the extent to which fundamental Christian doctrines are tossed aside for the sake of unity or charity is massive and cannot be understated. Despite this obvious reality, every day another you know, so-called solid pastor makes excuses for foxes in the vineyard. Wolves devour congregations while the shepherds are off herding goats. Now, we see there is a rot. There is a problem, a theological ineptitude. There, there is a lack of courage to stand up against heresy, especially with doctrines like defending the Trinity against the anti-Trinitarians, things like defending the literal need for Christ Jesus. These are all swept under the rug as tertiary issues. The root problem is textual atheism, and it has infected every square inch of the church in 2021. Textual atheism can be simply defined as a lack of belief that God has preserved and delivered his word to his people. 
Within this belief, one might be able to say that the Bible has been preserved, or that the Bible is inspired. But effectively, in today's bibliological environment, neither of those statements actually mean anything. They aren't true to the textual atheist because of how they define the Bible. To the textual atheist, the Bible isn't one thing. It's not the thing you're holding in your hand. It's a number of texts which they say are not doctrinally different. It's an amalgamation of things. Even though the words and even the passages are different between a number of these given texts, they call all of them the Bible. And they say so while also saying that not one of them is distinctly the Bible. So all of these things are the Bible, but not one of them. Not one of them is distinctly the Bible. And the Bible can change in wording because of the arbitrary claim that no doctrines are affected. And this results in a potentially infinite number of texts which can be considered the Bible, while none of them are specifically the Bible. This belief is at the center of what is called the critical text, which is the foundation for modern Bibles such as the ESV, NASB, CSB, NIV, and NLT. The ECM in Mark just was released, and there were over a hundred changes that now make the Bibles translated, so-called from it, obsolete. That's all the modern Bibles, allegedly, according to the prefatory material. So the theological disease of textual atheism has festered in the church for decades, and we are now seeing a full outbreak of contagion among the people of God. The first compromise was the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. And as much as people want to believe that that was the document that fought away the liberals and that, that solidified conservatism in the church, it actually opened up the gate for textual atheism. Because within the, the wording of the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, it places the authority of the scriptures in the authentication method of modern textual criticism. It says that something is original so long as it can be verified to be. And the, how are we verifying the original? Well, modern textual criticism. Now, the problem is the modern textual critics are not verifying the original. They're not trying to find the original. They may have the desire to. They may state that they would like to find the original or that that may be a personal goal of theirs. But within the axioms of their methodology, there isn't actually a way to do that. In order to validate with an empirical, you know, so-called scientific method, you actually have to have something to compare against. And in the case of the critical text, they, are, they have about a 300-year gap where they simply do not have the data to do so. So no matter what they say, usually the more, you know, and I'm using this word in the true sense of it, ignorant advocates of the critical text uh, don't know that. They don't know that the, that the textual critics proper in Germany and other places aren't actually trying to find the original, and in fact, they think that that is a, an outdated ambition. It's something that, that in our modern day is just something that's a little bit too naive. So this, th this theological disease of textual atheism has festered in the church for decades, as I said, starting kind of with the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy was when it was widely adopted. And the unfortunate majority of people who subscribe to this cannot know what the scriptures say because there is not a text that they can identify as the scriptures. They're all the scriptures. Scriptures, <clears throat> this, that is why it is textual atheism. The atheist says, well, God may exist, but I have no evidence to demonstrate that he does. Likewise, the textual atheist says, the original Bible may exist, but I have no evidence to demonstrate that it does. Instead, they state that we, quote, have good access to the scriptures, which is a really nice way, a really soft way of saying we don't have full access to the scriptures. So that is, uh, that's how they kind of play with words. If you, if you are, you know, if you're, if you're starting to de develop a discernment for how scholars talk, you know, when they say, well, we have good access, well, good is a moral uh, adjective. Good access just simply means that we have a decent access. We don't have full access. We don't have all the access. But when we say we have good access, it kind of puts people's guards down. They say we have good enough access. Ah, uh, but that's not orthodox. Having full or access is orthodox. So this belief that I have described demonstrates that the modern advocates of the system of the modern critical texts and other similar systems 
have no discernment or theological aptitude because this is clearly a heterodox belief. The biblical illiteracy of the modern pastor and person in the pew has left the church defenseless against the enemy and the world. The theological illiteracy has led to churches being overrun by bad doctrine and the enemy before they even realize what's actually going on. And unfortunately, the Apologetics Inc. industry has given Christians a false assurance. Because the problem is, these apologists get lauded and praised, wow, they're so smart, their arguments are so good. But the other side doesn't see it that way. In fact, they're running a fool's errand. They're playing the, the fool for these, for these enemies of the faith. In fact, they're actually working against the Christian church in a lot of time, in a lot of cases. Because, unfortunately, they're not addressing the real problem. The text that these apologists that use the critical text call the Word of God isn't really the Word of God. It is a Word of God. It is just another text that contains some of the Bible. And that is why the Muslims love to debate our apologists who want to talk about text-critical issues. Because then they go ahead and they record it and put it all over YouTube and say, See, look, they, they say they don't have a Bible. Islam must be correct. That's what they do. If you don't believe me, go search Muslim by choice on, on YouTube. There's plenty of documentation all over the internet that shows that the Muslim love to, to kind of join together in a, in a spectacle of so-called goodwill or good faith argumentation. They're not arguing in goodwill. They love to see Christians destroy themselves and then post it all over the internet. But this Apologetics Inc. sort of situation has Christians sort of putting their guard down. They think that, well, there's an apologetics book I can read that will defend you know, me from all sorts of error. But this is not a replacement to actually knowing the scriptures well. Apologetics should not in any case overcome in priority your knowledge of the scriptures. And that is the plain and simple truth. Now, if I wrote this article five years ago or recorded this podcast five years ago, I may have needed to make a more compelling case that the Christian church is biblically illiterate, that the, that the conservative church even is sick with biblical illiteracy. But today, the fruit is evident. Nearly every conservative denomination is fighting for its life right now on issues of intersectional feminism, critical so-called analytical tools, theological liber liberalism, and progressivism. And those that are not actively fighting have already lost. What's worse is that many of the churches who are making valiant stands against these issues are not addressing the root problem, which is, as I see it, textual atheism. All of these issues can be easily traced back to textual atheism. Every theological error that we're seeing in modernity can be approximately explained by the fact that people either don't believe in what the scripture says, or that they don't hold it as authoritative, or that they don't even know what scripture is. How can you develop a theological truth from a book that isn't settled? How could you possibly do that? How could you even stand by the statement of faith on your church website, knowing that it is founded on an ever-changing chimeric text? You can't do it in good faith. But churches do it all the time, and they don't understand... Why are things going wrong in the church? Well, your church needs a standard. Your church needs a standard that's not going to change. Or people will begin to lose faith in what you're calling the ultimate truth. See, year after year, if you say, this is God's word, we should believe in it. This is God's word, we should believe in it. And someone who is a lot older than myself might actually have lived long enough to see how this statement can lose its value. I mean, even me in the last 10 years, uh, we've been through, what, four ESVs, three ESVs now that have changed? I've seen that in my lifetime. Now, what does that do to the statement, this is the very word of God, when every year, every other year, every five years, it changes. The version that you're reading changes. It denigrates the authority, it denigrates the perception of the authority of scripture in the Christian mind. 
So I argue that this is because the church doesn't believe they have a Bible. So the issue today is no different from the issue in the beginning. It's always a matter of, yea, hath God said? Even the most conservative churches leave the door wide open for these errors to return if they do not address the theological atheism that causes these problems in the first place. And the primary concern for my reader, and my primary concern, should be that these theological errors put people in eternal danger. Practically, the concern is that Christians do not seem to care even pastors. Even in the most sound churches, elders are given a pass for poor discernment and shoddy theology because they have the right credential, or because maybe they are nice or well-meaning. Oh, how could you say that that pastor has an error? He's so sweet to everybody. This is the kind of discernment that I see all the time. Just because someone is kind or generous or well-meaning can cover the fact that they have a grave theological uh, error that they're teaching people. That's the level of discernment we've come to in 2021. And so Christians, and I find especially pastors, have somehow fallen into the trap of thinking that because some authority teaches something that it must be true and orthodox. And this isn't helped by the rampant celebrity culture and modern conservative evangelicalism. You see this all the time. You dare say anything against Tim Keller. Oh, you must be slandering, and I need to talk to your pastor, mister. Happens all the time. We see this in the text critical discussion with men like Dan Wallace all the time. Even though Wallace has outright rejected providential preservation, said the Bible doesn't teach it, states plainly that, that, the, that the Bible, we don't have the original, and even if we did, we wouldn't know it. Christians defend him tooth and nail and invite him into their seminaries and to teach from their pulpits in their churches. And if their pastor were to say some of the things that he had said, I'm guessing he wouldn't have a pulpit. But no, because Dan Wallace says it. Oh, well, he's the expert. He can say these things and it's still orthodox somehow. See, the lack of discernment is staggering. It is staggering. Christians defend him, bring them in their churches, and let him teach the sheep. Pastors and lay people alike shout slander at those who would have the discernment and an ounce of courage to say something about Dan Wallace's false doctrine. And this even happens at the local level. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a story that, uh, about a pastor that I confronted uh, at one point. He's a confessional, London Baptist Confession of Faith pastor, and I rebuked him or challenged him. I, I would say I, wouldn't re I didn't rebuke him. I would say I respectfully... Uh, challenged him for using the Ugaritic literature and for some context, the Ugarites were Baal worshiping pagans uh, during Old Testament times. And he was using their newly discovered literature, newly discovered texts to actually change the meaning and even the words in his Old Testament. And despite this clearly violating the confessional standard in chapter 1, laid out in both the London Baptist and the Westminster Confession of Faith, often called Scripture Interpret Scripture, in, in this case, the Ugarites Interpret Scripture, I was actually called manipulative and abusive and that I, that I didn't have the education to make a judgment on the topic. Now, that is shocking. Because that in itself is extraordinarily toxic extraordinarily toxic but that's what happens to people's minds when they're confronted on these issues they become volatile and toxic themselves see when you can't answer an argument and you just start calling people names it's typically a sign that you might not be correct or have the correct argument in that moment in any case it didn't matter to him i i, I had sent screenshots of of hebrew exegesis of my analysis of his argument, uh, which he sent me a paper from a very secular authority. And, and that is part of the reason why I no longer deal with individual variants, because it does not matter to these people who have been overcome by whatever this is. As it goes with atheists, evidence means absolutely nothing to people that are trapped in this textual atheistic mindset. So both examples are evidence that point to deep spiritual rot even in the conservative church. 
because this 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 pastor was a Westminster guy, Westminster East guy. So you can't even say, oh, well, it's just a Westminster West problem. No, this this guy's an old school Westminster East guy. It's a problem and an Old Testament scholar, according to him. This is a problem that is deeply, deeply rooted in the evangelical church and has even made inroads into what we might call the conservative or reformed church. It proliferates across all departments in the seminaries. And some are quick to triage the symptoms of this. Some, very few, like critical race theory, for example, the bold men who actually said something right as it was happening and continue to say it today. There's very few people that did that. While failing to address the textual atheism that is the root cause, they might say, oh, well, we don't want female pastors. Oh, we don't want critical race theory. Let me make a stand against this all the while doing so from an, a critical text Bible. A critical text Bible, which isn't done being developed, which the scholars who produce it say, no, that's not the original. Uh, in fact, if we did have the original, if that was the original, we would have no way of actually knowing that. It's just going to keep changing. They're doing their defense of the faith from a book that is just a text among texts. And that's not authoritative, and everybody knows it. Everybody that is attacking the church knows it. Absolutely. So this is a problem that, that is deeply rooted in the evangelical church, and I believe deeply rooted in conservative churches as well. And in many cases, pastors and laymen... <clears throat> don't know their Bible well enough or know the theological truths that are contained in the Bible well enough, or they simply do not believe the Bible in the way it was written. And so they can't actually defend the faith because they, they, they don't have a proper understanding of scripture and they don't know the scriptures. And this is a huge problem. I once uh, was sitting in a church or uh, not sitting in a church. I was, I was, I was at a church coffee shop. Yeah, that's right. And I was talking to one of the staff members there and we were just talking about some, some story uh, about a member in their church or, you know, something, some group that they had or something like this. I forget. It was such a long time ago, but we were talking and I remember one thing though, that he specifically said, it was something to, to the effect of, oh yeah, you know, I'm not super familiar with that in my Bible. And this is a, a staffer at a mainstream evangelical church. Uh, that's in leadership, I believe, was youth ministry. And this kind of thing, I, I just distinctly remember him admitting that he didn't know his Bible very well. And he was on staff as a, you know, a youth pastor or whatever they call them. This, this kind of thing is very common. And, and from my uh, experience, Christians are too eager to defend things like this. They want to give people charity and they want to be nice, which you know, charity can be good in, in its appropriate context. But when we're talking about people that are teaching, people that are pastoring, I don't believe that there's any call for charity for them to be inequipped. I, I just simply don't think this is the case, but we've done this. Uh, the, the, the fathers of our faith, of, of my generation, left our generation in this state and we have to fight it. We have to be the ones that are harsh because they were too charitable. In any case, this is just a common problem. And even if these men and women do believe in the authority of Scripture, if they subscribe to the critical text at the same time, what their Bible says isn't definitive, isn't authoritative, and it isn't permanent. And this is because the mainstream doctrine of Scripture teaches that we do not have the original Bible, only good access or lack of access to it. The text that a critical text pastor teaches from as God's word is changing with every new edition, it changes every new time and a new translation of the ESV is made. It changes every time the ECM is updated. Every time the NA28 comes out with a new edition, or the, the Nestle Lawn or UBS team comes out with a new edition, the critical text changes in dozens of places. This is how a conservative pastor can use a hermeneutic principle taken from Baal-worshipping pagans and still have a pulpit in a confessional church. The Bible is said to be changing, and the way that pastors treat it in the quiet of their study shows it. This lack of discernment has led to the destruction of meaning in the words confessional, conservative, and biblical. What do those words even mean anymore? Nothing, as far as I can tell. 
It is not conservative for a pastor or layperson to literally change the words that are on the page of the Bible, especially on account of a Ugarite, and yet that is common practice. Every pastor who has taken a Greek exegesis class is taught to produce their own translation, their own text, and their own meaning. There is no common understanding for what the Bible is, what it says, or what it teaches. The theological liberals know this, and this is one point that I want you to remember. The theological liberals know this, and they have been exploiting the good faith of faithful men and women of God for decades. That's how the enemy works. They exploit your fruit. They exploit your good heart. They exploit your charity. And they know all of this, and they use it. The victims, really, at the end of the day of this toxic ideology are the Christians who sit under teaching in these churches. They look down at the words in the page of their Bible and see that their pastor is changing words on the fly as he preaches, sometimes changing the meaning of the whole passage. They are led to believe that they are getting the best instruction because their pastor is using the original languages. All the while, their pastor subscribes to the doctrine that the Bible isn't even translated from an inspired original. Perhaps the pastor does believe in providential preservation and that the words are inspired. But every time that a pastor changes the text on the fly, he undermines the text that he's preaching from. He's telling his congregation, this is not a good Bible. Mine is better. And the, and the person in the pew has no idea or the tools to deal with that kind of behavior and practice. The modern critical text pastor is far worse than Karl Barth in this regard. At least Karl Barth was self-aware when he preached from Calvin's pulpit in Geneva. Barth at least felt a duty to teach historical orthodoxy, even if he himself didn't believe it. The people in the pew were far less harmed from Barth's pulpit than they are today from the pulpit of a critical text pastor. This textual atheism is the mainstream conservative position supported by the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy and the writings of modern textual scholars and apologists. The belief that God did not intend to preserve his word perfectly is the standard among the intellectual class who produce and advocate for the critical text. This is not disputed, and the fact that this statement is passed along as orthodox should prove to my reader that there is a deep sickness in the church. This has been allowed to fester, due to the general biblical illiteracy among the people of God today. And we have to own that. The people in Christian churches do not have the ability to hear theological error when it comes from the pulpit or from a conference table. You may find yourself offended at the broad statements that I have made in this article, but if you are, I encourage you to answer a couple of questions. Did God preserve and make available his whole word to his people? Do you believe that there are no corruptions in the text of Scripture? Do you believe that God desired to preserve every jot and tittle accomplished and accomplish that task? And if you answered no, that the whole word isn't preserved, that there might be one or two corruptions, that it wasn't every jot and tittle, then you're a textual atheist. You have no way of demonstrating that the book you're reading is the Bible. You do not believe that God was capable of preserving his word, and so it must be reconstructed by us. Us perfect scholars, our perfect scholars who are so learned, they can do the job that God could not. In other words, the textual atheist believes that God failed in his promise to be with his people and communicate with them in scripture. And you cannot prove that scripture has been corrupted in any one place, and that's the biggest folly of this whole effort. You can't prove corruption. But they insist. They insist because of different manuscripts it's corrupted. In other words, God has failed and the scholars must fix what God has failed in. The only way that you can get from the Bible has been corrupted to the Bible is inerrant, in the case of this cognitive dissonance, is one of blind, unthinking, undiscerning, Kantian-type faith. It is a position that puts trust in the scholars and not God. It is a position that would rather trust in the interpretation and text of, for example, a Baal-worshipping Ugaritic text over and above what God says in his word. It is plain and simple, a form of functional atheism. 
The simple truth is that this textual atheism cannot hold on to the orthodox doctrine of scripture without a severe contradiction that really invalidates the entire thing. Either the Bible is the very word of God, or, quote, we do not have now in any critical Greek text or in any translations exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Even if we did, we would not know it, end quote. That's your boy Dan Wallace. The advocates of the critical text have not accounted for this contradiction, though they have tried to answer it by simply saying that the corruptions don't matter. Eh, they're not that important. God's word, the changes in it, not a big deal. But we must ask, how can they even know that corruptions don't matter when they do not know what the original said? How do they know that what they have isn't a severe corruption? They don't. In other words, they're lying. When they say that the corruptions don't matter, doctrine doesn't, isn't changed. They don't and they can't know that. They state that the Bible is the word of God, all while believing that we don't actually have a Bible. No, according to them, we have Bibles, and all of them are the word of God or contain the word of God, or witness to the word of God. This is nonsensical and contradictory, unless, of course, you change the orthodox doctrine of scripture, which they have. The Christian faith teaches that God is powerful and able to do what he pleases. So the question is not about manuscript evidence, as that is useless to the task at hand. The question is, do you believe that God preserved all his word, and do you have it today? The alternative is textual atheism. Thank you for watching this podcast episode of the Young Texas and Reformed. I am your host, Taylor DeSoto. May the Lord bless you and keep you. I hope this has been helpful, if not too fiery. And we will see you all in the next video.